Amen. Well, as you, uh, for those of you who've been with us for a while, you, you know that we're actually on a series called God, where we're investigating Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and just breaking down some false beliefs, probably, uh, on, on each of those members of the Godhead, and, and uh, just really explaining that. Of course, uh, as of recent, we've been talking about Father God, and, and just really dipping into who He is. We, we're, we still have a lot of wonderful truths to excavate to that point. In fact, Pastor Misty is going to be bringing a message this Sunday on that point, so, so that's going to be good. So i got three or four of you that seem excited about that. That's good. Yeah. May I remind you of what I just said about the enthusiasm? going to have to... Have we not had coffee? Is that what it is? <laughs> now, so I, uh, so I started out Easter thinking, well, this is perfect, you know? We, we've been talking about the, the goodness of the Father and his, his role in the Godhead, and we, we, it, it, just, it just seemed perfect for me as like a, like a softball pitch, you know? I thought, we've got this amazing Father in heaven, you know, who, because he loved us so incredibly well, he sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus, and you know what I mean? It just, it laid itself up, and so I started writing accordingly, and I got maybe a paragraph deep, and I heard this question. What makes Christians believe that they're right? I thought, oh yeah, I've heard that one before. I've had people say that to my face. What makes you think you've got the corner market? on religion, you know, and that out of all the stuff that's going on, you guys would have this thing all buttoned up, in, you know, in, in the face of all the other opinions and all the other things that are going on. And, and the supposition is really this. It's, it's that there are many world religions, and, and if you consider world religions, you, you would have to understand that, uh, at least until the advent of the internet, that they are predominantly regionally specific. You know, like India's Hinduism, you know, you've got the, uh, the rest of Asia, which is primarily Buddhist, and, you know, you have Islam, and you have, but it's, it's regionally specific, and that makes Christianity a Western religion. You follow me so far? And, and so they're looking at it and kind of going, well, you've picked Christianity because, you know, it's a Western religion, but, but how dare you think in all of your arrogance that somehow you've got this thing locked down when we have all of these other cultures that have existed way longer than you and your measly couple of hundred years of existence, right? I mean, has anybody ever, ever talked to anybody like this? No? Why do we think we've got the market cornered on this deal when all these other things exist? And, and part and parcel with, with the question and, and this, this reality that we face, that there are, in fact, regionally specific world religions that are out there, uh, part and parcel with that is this idea that not one religion could possibly get it right, so, so none of the world religions have it right. All of us have it wrong in some ways, and, and all of us uh, have some elements that are correct, and so what we should do is we should actually just pull from, from all of the world religions to include Christianity, compile it all together, and this then, this is the, this is the truth. Like this would be a, a better representation of the reality of, of how we ultimately prepare for eternity. But listen, the problem with this, and look, this is a widespread philosophy right now. The problem with this is that we end up with a God in our own image. And, and here's what I mean by this. Uh, years ago, I remember hearing Richard Gere. Uh, anybody remember that guy? Uh, <laughs> like, I don't, what was the last thing he ever acted in? I don't know, something in 1983, I'm sure. I don't know. So Richard Gere, you know, he, uh, he was talking about Buddhism. If you don't know, he's, he's embraced Buddhism. And he was talking about with Buddhism, one of the things that he liked about it was his ability to pick and choose what he liked and what he didn't like, and he could embrace you know, meditation and this and that and the other, uh, and just really kind of dismiss all of the other things. Well, of course, that's not Buddhism, but that was his westernized version of, of Buddhism. Uh, but that's exactly what we've done with these world religions. We kind of go, nah, you know, I, I don't like the self-abasement of Buddhism, so you can keep that. That's not, that's not good. You know, uh, meditating on a mountain, that, oh, that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. That's, that sounds peaceful. That's great, good. You know, and, and I, I don't like in Islam how they suggest that in, unless you adhere to their strict sect's interpretation, you know, of the Quran, that basically they, no, not basically, let me, let me make it super clear, that everyone should die. Did you know that was in the Quran, by the way? Yeah, yeah, you're an infidel, and they believe that you should die because you don't believe in their strict 
interpretation of the Quran. You know, and well, you know, we don't, we don't really like, I mean, we're Western, right? I mean, we there's laws against this kind of thing. So you can keep that part of Islam. I mean, we'll, we'll take another piece and we'll mix it in. And, and Christianity, you know, it has its stuff too. Uh, I really don't like what the Word of God has to say about sex outside of marriage. So we're going to go ahead and leave that off the table too. And the result then is, that we get a man-centered religion that takes a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it puts it together in this smorgasbord, like this cocktail of religion that really has us at the center and serves our needs and our needs alone. Uh, we've got a definition for that. It's called humanism. Man at the center. We're, we're worshiping us. It's like, I really like that. That's going to make me feel good. It's going to tickle my ears. This guy, I'm going to be comfortable with that. I mean, how many of you know with Christianity, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make you comfortable? <laughs> right? We, we have a father who says that he disciplines those who he loves, his children. I, I don't like that part. They can keep that. I don't want, you know, I don't. Right? There are some uncomfortable parts to this equation. But at the end of the day, have you answered the question for yourself? Why do you believe you're right? Have you ever taken a moment to consider why, in fact, you believe that you're right? Can I submit to you this morning this? Christianity is the only religion in the world that actually has support for what it believes. Ironclad evidence to support the assertions of this book that we have called the Bible. And I, we'll, get, we'll get to that. We'll talk about some of the proofs. I, I won't have, golly, 1219? What is wrong with you people? Somebody seriously has been praying over the clock that it would speed up. <laughs> That's the issue around here I've just come to discover. You know, but we'll get to some of the evidence. First, I, I want to talk to you about some of those world religions. Is that okay? Thought you were coming to hear an Easter sermon, didn't you? We'll get to that. <laughs> so Buddhism, Siddhartha de Gautama is actually the original Buddha. You were premature on that, man. You're like, like you shot before they said go. Couldn't get there. <laughs> <laughs> Siddhartha de Gautama is, is the original Buddha. He's the guy that founded that entire world religion, Siddhartha Gautama. He was a guy who was born somewhere between Nepal and India. I, I believe it was around 600 BC, you know, some, somewhere in there. He was actually a prince of his kingdom. And uh, at any rate, he was just a guy. And how many of you know that Siddhartha de Gautama never, ever, not in his lifetime, claimed to be God? He never said that, never claimed to be God. That only happened many years after his death when his supporters began to declare he was Buddha, he was God, the enlightened one. Here's what happened. He was just a man who went out to look for the reasons for human suffering. How many of you know we've got some reasons for that? Right? Don't you wish you were a missionary in 600 B.C.? I mean, that's at least how I think. I was like, man, I wish I could have been there. I could have talked to him. He was seeking. I could have given him the answers, you know? 600 B.C., there he is. He's looking for the answer. Why is there suffering for human beings? He goes out. He goes through a whole process. He can't find it. He ends up in the woods by himself meditating. He gets a download, a revelation. Ah, this revelation they call enlightenment. And then this man, Siddhartha Gautama, begins to declare, begins to preach this supposed uh, enlightenment, this encounter, this revelation that he had received while fasting and meditating in the woods out by himself. Okay, but listen to what I'm saying to you. One man meditates out in the middle of a woods, gets what he thinks is a download, and births an entire world religion eventually as a result of it. What proof is there to support his assertions? Are we to really believe that one guy... I mean, right, in the, in the fallibility of man and, and, and all of our impure motives and sinful nature that, 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 that some guy, some individual just like you and me is sitting out in the woods meditating and all of a sudden gets the keys to the universe, the keys to your eternity? Where's the support? Where's the evidence? The entire premise for this world religion is based on one man's opinion. Islam, Islam is, is not different, really. In fact, it's exactly the same, as you'll find that all of them are. 
Islam bases its entire world religion off of a prophet they call a prophet Muhammad. The prophet Muhammad, as the story goes, had an encounter with an angel. The angel, angel ultimately gives him a download of revelation that eventually births the Quran. The Quran, which they believe, and let me quote this, they believe is the pre-existent and perfect words of Allah. Okay, so out of this encounter births this word, this, if you will, let's put it in our language, divinely inspired word of God. In this divinely inspired word of God called the Quran, it, 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 it's written that there were other pre-existent texts that were also divinely inspired by God, and then it enumerates them. They happen to be the first five books of the Old Testament, your Old Testament, the Psalms of David, and the Gospels of Jesus Christ. The Quran of Islam testifies to the world that those books of the Bible have been divinely inspired, breathed by God, and that they are truth as a result of that. Well, here's the problem. Those books of the Bible that the Quran says is divinely inspired, they directly contradict what we find in the Quran itself. Well, how could that be? I mean, one example is with, with Jesus himself. The Gospels clearly testify that Jesus Christ, being God who came to take away the sins of the world, that he died, that he was resurrected. He was crucified on a cross on Calvary. He resurrected again. They left the grave completely empty. That's the gospel story. All the gospels are clear on this point. The Quran says, no, no, that's not true. Jesus wasn't crucified. That's an interesting contradiction from two books that are apparently divinely inspired by the same God. Additionally, the Quran says that Jesus isn't God. Uh, I, I, it's fascinating to me that they do have a place for Jesus, and I, I believe they have fine, uh, rather five what they call divine messengers, and Jesus was one of what they would call a divine messenger. So Jesus himself was, was from God, according to their religion, and yet he himself said he was God, so there's another interesting contradiction. I, I, I want to ask, I, how could this be? How can you have one guy get a supposed download? In fact, in this case, he has an encounter with an angel that ultimately diverts the course of human history and births this world religion. Like, how, how is it even possible for something like that to happen? And might I remind you of this? Your Bible says that the demons come masquerading as angels of light trying to deceive you. But listen, listen. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14 of Satan, it says this, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. What does that mean? It means he looks pretty contrary to all of our drawings. It means he's coming to you to try to win you with a message, to try to make you think that he's actually coming from God. Listen to this even further. Paul's admonishing the Galatians, uh, chapter 1 and verse 8. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven, do you hear that? Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he shall be accursed. That's pretty heavy language coming from the premier apostle who wrote two-thirds of our New Testament. We all right? So a demonic spirit comes, has an encounter with this guy named Muhammad. An entire world religion is birthed out of it. Our scripture clearly encourages against such interactions. And yet here we are, right? But what proof do we have? What proof do we have to substantiate the assertions of the Quran, Muhammad, or the religion of Islam? It's just a guy. A guy having an encounter with an angel that communicated something contrary to what the Word of God says. Are we to look past all of the contradictions inherent in its own supposed divine writings and place our, the well-being of our eternity in the hands of... <laughs> are you seeing what I'm saying? Mormonism's super, super similar. Of course, it's not a world religion. <laughs> but I thought I'd toss it in just for fun. In Mormonism, we have a guy named Joseph Smith. He's a normal character within history. Who also 
has an encounter with an angel. The angel gives him a download, a revelation as well, that, that results in what we now call the Book of Mormon. He, he says, in fact, that, that it was only dictated to him. He just wrote it all down. It was divinely inspired by God through this angelic encounter that he has. But here again is the problem. We have one man with some ecstatic vision who ends up writing a word, the Book of Mormon, which stands in contradiction to the Word of God that preexisted the Book of Mormon. Are you beginning to see a picture here? How time and time again, the religions that we have that are out there, they do not stand the test of scrutiny. You just you boil them back to a single individual that has an encounter with an angel or with meditation, with whatever it is, but an individual who says, hey, follow me, I've got some things figured out. An individual whose thoughts and whose beliefs cannot be substantiated, in, in which there is no evidence to support their theories, gar garners the, the, the support of people that are around them to continue to propagate those lies at the expense of the one and true gospel. So how does Christianity hold up? I mean, if we're going to go after the other world religions, I mean, we might as well go after... I'm realizing we never did do the coexist thing. <laughs> That's all right. We'll get to that. Now we won't. <laughs> how does Christianity hold up to the same level of scrutiny? Remember I said, I prefaced this whole thing with, Christianity is the only one that has any proof. See, it requires some evidence, doesn't it? We all right? Talking about Easter. Jesus coming out of the grave. Supporting evidence. Are we alive? <laughs> Let's take just the Bible, for example. The Bible has not only been around and existed intact for thousands of years. And by the way, there are arguments that are out there against the Bible saying a bunch of cuckoos put it all together and they've mistranslated and retranslated and rewrote and did all this kind of hodgepodge and made this shake called the Bible that we've got now and that none of it can actually be trusted. That's the furthest thing from the truth. Anybody who's ever studied the Bible or any sort of, done any sort of scholarly exercise surrounding the Bible knows that that's all just hogwash. You know, we've got the Dead Sea Scrolls that we found, you know, thousands of year old documents that are to the letter exactly verbatim what we have in our Bibles right now today. You know, I do my studies every Sunday out of the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. You know, it's, it, it, I've got a limited amount of time, so let's, let's be careful. Let's be careful. That same Bible, do you realize that within the text Within the text, within the chapters of Scripture, there are a number of scientific claims. Things like how the earth was suspended in space and the, the number of the stars in the heaven. These are claims that scientifically we would not discover through our abundance of technology for thousands of years after the Bible declared them so. There was a time when we thought we could actually, we could actually number the, the stars. The people who were attempting got up to like a thousand. Uh, how many do we have now? Yeah, we can't count them. You know, the invention of the Hubble Space Telescope tells us there are billions of galaxies, stuff we haven't even discovered yet, stars galore. There's no possible way we could count them. At one point in time, we thought we would, but guess what the Bible says? They can't be numbered, right? There are a number of scientific claims that have been proven over and over and over again. The Bible, in this sense, has withstood the test of time and scrutiny from outside eyes looking in. But let me ask you, how in the world would they know anything about any of that unless it was divinely inspired? What's more is, archaeologically, over and over again, the Bible continues to be found right in its assertions, even over characters in history that other texts suggest don't exist, like King David. You know, there's no record for King David in your normal history books, right? And they began at some point to accuse you Bible thumpers of making up a story. See this, this King David, who your beloved King David, even your Messiah, came through David's lineage, and the guy doesn't even exist in history until they began to excavate all of the archaeological discoveries and finds that talked about King David and what it would do in the, the city and the palace. They've even got his palace, of all things, right? Archaeologically, over and over again, the Bible has been proved despite its critics' best efforts. Listen to this. Dr. Clifford Wilson, former director of Australian Institute of Archaeology, says this. 
It's remarkable that where confirmation is possible and has come to light, the Bible stands investigation in ways that are unique in all of literature. Its superiority to attack, its capacity to withstand criticism, its amazing faculty to be proved right after all, are all staggering by any standard of scholarship. Seemingly assured results disproving the Bible have a habit of backfiring. Over and over again, the Bible has been vindicated. Isn't that beautiful? So why is Christianity right? Look, just even from the offset we can see, on one hand in every world religion and everybody else who's ever tried, we have flawed, inconsistent, divinely inspired texts as they stand opposed to a Bible that's withstood thousands of years and only continues to be proved right every single day. But it's, this, stuff, this stuff is impressive to me, but, but what impresses me even more are the accounts of Jesus. They're the accounts of Jesus. And listen, there is absolutely no way this morning, I already having my time be up officially, but don't look back. Don't look back. <laughs> There's no way I could do this sermon, this series justice on a Sunday morning. There's just, there's, there's literally a plethora of evidence to support that Jesus is who he said he was, that the Bible is and does what it says it does, that all of the words are true. So there's no possible way this morning I could even begin to scrape the surface of the hundreds of prophecies that Jesus meticulously fulfilled. Are you aware of that? In some counts, up to like 300 some prophecies that Jesus meticulously fulfilled. People as, as old as a thousand years before Jesus was born, prophesying who he would be born to and what village he would be born to, that they would come after him when he was a baby and have to flee out to Egypt, that who's, what tribe, the tribe of David that he would be born to, even all the way up to the point that he would be crucified on a cross, a type of capital punishment that did not even exist in the day in which it was prophesied. Now let me ask you, what do you picture in a thousand years from now? You think you can make something up and get it right? Look, I was telling first service, I didn't even have internet in my high school when I, in my freshman year. Now I've got it in my pocket. You know what I mean? We're talking like, you know, between 10 and, I'll give you a span, between 10 and 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> the whole world has changed. You know, the 1900s generation, we have our, you know, our beloved Huffmakers who are here who literally see the invent of airplanes. You know, now we've got rocket ships that go on land that run over 700 miles an hour, you know, setting the land speed record. I mean, we go from walking and horses and buggies like in a very short amount of time, basically one generation, to like rocket powered, I don't even know what you call that thing, running 700 miles an hour. Look, there's no way we could possibly even conceive of anything a thousand years from now. We're just not going to be able to do it unless we have divine intervention and it's divinely inspired. Listen, Jesus fulfilled hundreds of these prophecies. And so I'm probably also not going to have time this morning to talk about how it's mathematically impossible that he did so. Take a look at the board here. Out of the 48 messianic prophecies that were there, now granted there were hundreds, the odds of Jesus fulfilling those prophecies are one in... <laughs> I, I don't even know how to use... I just, I got nothing on that. I don't know. Math majors, like what is that? That's a big number. That's, that's what I know. That is way beyond my scope of understanding. The probability that Jesus would fulfill even eight of those prophecies, just even eight, was like, you know, ten sextillion. I don't even know what that is. I just read it. What's sextillion? I don't know. Sounds creepy. <laughs> but I can tell you this. It is mathematically impossible that Jesus came doing what he did. Why do Christians think they're right? Why do Christians think they're right? Because there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that says that Jesus was who he said he was. Listen, there is no other religion on the planet, no other world religion, there's probably some quackpots out there, I don't know, no world religion that ever had anybody come to this planet and suggest that they were God. Only one, that's Christianity. We only had one. And listen, 
Jesus Christ, it is fully uncontested. He was absolutely a historical figure. He really did breathe. He really did live. It's uncontested. There's so much overwhelming evidence that he existed. It, it, it's so much. And of course, there's always weirdos who try to assert different things. But listen, it's likened, like if you don't believe that Jesus was a real person at this point, it's just like saying, yeah, I don't believe in George Washington. <laughs> that guy, you guys are crazy. George Washington didn't exist. I mean, after all, who in this room met him? Oh, nobody? Okay, yeah, so, so you, anybody know any of his family members? Okay, so that's a big fat no. Uh, anybody read any books by George Washington? Okay, I'm going to go with no before somebody raises a hand there on that one. You know? <laughs> you know, the only reason we believe that George Washington exists is because your school teacher told you so. That's enough for me. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, there's a plethora of evidence to support his existence. We're like, meh, I don't know about that. Well, anybody who's, in, anybody who's studied it at all, and all of the scholars now, unilateral agreement, he did exist. But here's the problem with him existing. If Jesus Christ was a real guy, if he really did walk the earth, that has implications on our life, doesn't it? See, and all of the world religions are in agreement. Yep, he was a real guy. He, was, he really did. Islam says he was one of their divine messengers. He was a guy who came from God. Other religions say, yep, he was just a prophet. Some others say, yeah, he really lived, but he was a guy. And somehow in our culture, we've gotten to this place where we're like, well, we're not prepared to say he exists, even though everybody else has already got a place for him. Jesus Christ existed that means we have to do something about it because he also said that he was God. Now, what separates him from Joseph Smith and Muhammad and all the other crackpots? Take that, YouTube. Because <laughs> seriously, if there's no evidence to support the assertion, he's just another guy claiming to be God or claiming to do this, claiming to do that. Are you aware that we even have extra biblical texts that write down some of the miracles that Jesus did while he existed? <laughs> while he was here in the flesh, that is. Right? So we have a guy who comes to the earth claiming to be God. Other people who don't have any skin in the game attest, yep, this guy's doing miracles. Okay, you got my attention now. He empties a tomb. The fact that he was crucified, prophesied 700 years before, Isaiah 700 years before it happens, prophesies that Jesus would be laid to death with a rich man. We know that there's Joseph of Arimathea who actually opened up his tomb. He was a, what we would call like a judge on the Supreme Court. He opens up his tomb, a wealthy man, and they lay Jesus to rest. There's a 2,000 pound rock that's rolled over the entrance of the tomb. Look, this, are all, this is historically accurate. Extra biblical texts attest to the very thing that the Bible has already asserted from the very beginning. 2,000 pound stone rolls over the entrance of the grave. Do you think a couple of women could move that? Sorry, ladies. A couple of big, hairy guys. Does that make you feel better? <laughs> How many guys do you think it's going to take to move away that stone? And are they going to be able to do so without waking up the soldier who's standing guard at the tomb at risk of his own life? And yet, extra biblical texts support this idea that the governing authorities at the time of this, this is all unfolding, they, they weren't disputing whether Jesus existed, of course. They were, dispute, they, they were disputing the missing body. They were like, uh, what are we going to do now that he's missing? You understand, all they had to say is, here he is in the tomb. Hey, everybody, okay, yeah, 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 everybody who thinks so, come and take a look at this. We're going to call this, a, this is a new feast day. We're going to feast your eyes on the dead Jesus in this tomb so we can quench all of these rumors to the contrary. That's all they would have had to do, but they did not. History records there was no body in that tomb that day. He was gone. There's an overwhelming amount of evidence that I can't even begin to get into today that supports that premise. But listen, aside from all of that, why are Christians right? Because he's alive. That's why we're right. Because he's alive. Because he's utterly transformed my life and many of your lives. I know where I started, and I'm telling you right now, it's not where I am now. And it's way better on this side of the tracks than it is over there. 
I've seen the unfolding of God's truths in my life. He speaks to us. How many of you heard God? He talks to us. He leads us. He guides us. He educates us. And you know this? He not only wants us to be like Him, to look like Him, He wants us to be His hands and feet. I'll never forget a young girl that was brought to me and a couple of others in India. She'd been catatonic for three days completely out of it, immobile. They had to carry her in. She's stiff as a board. Face all gnarled up and contorted. We prayed for her for three hours. She wakes up out of the stupor, completely set free. Her face twists back around, back into normal. I meet this young lady in, in the village trail the day after, and she says, hey, and I'm like, mm, hey. I have no idea who she is. I literally did not recognize her. She did not look like the same girl. She had joy all over her. And she was like, thank you so much for praying for me, for setting me free. Listen, I've seen the living God do miracles. Can't tell me he doesn't exist. We've seen fibroid myalgia healed. Come on. Chronic fatigue syndrome. How many years? 20 years. Chronic fatigue syndrome. Fibroid myalgia. I've seen atrial fibrillation healed right in this church. A gal sat right there on that front row. We laid hands on her. She got healed of cancer years ago. Come on, we have seen God, the living God, step into our world and do what he has always done, what he's always desired to do. I just got a report from a young man, 20 years old, autism, nonverbal autism. Hadn't talked a day in 20 years. They laid hands on him. The kids started talking 40 minutes straight when they finally started calling people and testifying. I don't know what's happened. He just, he started just speaking. Hadn't spoken a word in 20 years. Healed of autism. Come on. Why are Christians right? Because Jesus is alive today. Because he's doing the same things he did in the books that we read in the Bible. He's doing it today and he wants to do it through you. Countless transformed lives, my own being one of them. And listen, here's the deal. I know I'm taking you a little bit late, but you'll be all right. The food will still be there. <laughs> he wants to transform your life today too. And so if you've come in here, listen, the odds are somebody's come in this morning and you're like, man, I didn't know where I stood when I walked through the front door, but I can feel God's presence in this place. And I know that he's calling me. I don't have all the answers. But I really believe it's true. And if that's you this morning, I, I, look, we're not trying to make a spectacle of you. We just want to know so we can partner with you in prayer. You know, and we can help introduce you to our Lord and Savior. If you've come in this morning and you just need another start, or you've never started at all, would you, must, would you mind just doing me the favor? Just raise your hand with me this morning. Just want to give you an opportunity. We're not going to spend a bunch of time. We just want to make sure on Easter Sunday, the day where we celebrate that there, in fact, is an empty tomb. That you guys, before you leave here, have an opportunity to make him your Lord and save you too. Anybody out there? All right, if you're a scaredy cat, <laughs> then I want to encourage you. We've got a prayer ministry team that will come up here in a few minutes, and they will love on you. They will pray for you. You don't have to raise your hand in front of a crowd of people, okay? But I really want you to come forward, to have that conversation with them. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So if God's ministered to work in your heart this morning, come and tell somebody, would you? Yeah. Father, we, we thank you for being so amazing that you would send your only begotten son. And God, you, we, we so often, we, we navigate these roads, say, well, it's a, we, we, you know, we do all this stuff by faith, and it's so true, the righteous will live by faith, and yet there's an overwhelming amount of evidence out there to support that you are God. You are who you said. It's, it's, it's confounding. It, it's unbelievable. And yet there it is. This morning, Jesus, we yield our hearts again to you completely. We lay it all down. Our lives, God, they're not our own. The keys to our life, our destiny, where we're headed from here, it's not ours. It's not our decision. We give it completely to you. Savior of our lives, we give it to you, God. We lay these lives before you that you would make something glorious out of us. We've tried it on our own way and it hasn't worked out so good. 
Some of us are continuing, even though, God, we've given our lives to you. It's like, no, there's a section that I'm not willing to give. We've continued to try to do it on our own, and it's not working great for you either. But today, Jesus, we say, we give you the keys to every chamber in our heart. We lay it all down. We celebrate you, your finished work on the cross, and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven right now as we speak. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.